Why does this copy of Farmstead cost $700, in spite of the fact of it being a truly terrible magic card? All that and more in today's video. This video is brought to you by Ren, but more on that in a moment. Money. It makes the world go round. It's the root of all evil, and it's the reason oil companies ignored all of the warning signs about climate change that they knew about decades ago. Wait, my third point was just my second point, but like more specific. Magic cards, a game for some, and an investment portfolio for people with unwashed asses. The cost of a magic card can range wildly, from pennies for a heavily reprinted common that sees little play, to $50 upwards for modern staples, to thousands for collectors of rarity items. The important thing to note about magic cards is that the collect Collectability of them is not always tied to the playability. There are cards in Modern Horizons, for example, that are expensive because they are played in Modern and, to a lesser extent, Legacy and Commander, but there are plenty of cards in Magic that are expensive simply for the fact that they haven't been reprinted or can't be. They're just rare. It's through their legacy and their scarcity. And I want to clarify as well, whilst I like to tease and poke fun at the financial types looking to trade insider secrets to make a profit and an anti-reprint, I do think that having a healthy secondary market and a collector's market is good for the game overall. It's why I'm starting to, and this is kind of a separate video, but I'm starting to think that a hundred different varieties of every single fucking magic card is not a good thing, because it scares people off from being completionists or collecting or even selling cards on the secondary market, because listing them becomes a fucking chore and most cards aren't worth anything. I'd much prefer if we had a really super cheap variant and an expensive chase variant of cards, as opposed to 50,000 versions that are all worth fuck all. Either way, today I'm gonna to take you through five silly expensive magic cards that aren't worth it. These cards fucking suck. And of course, by fucking sucking, I am talking about a subjective thing, right? I'm talking about cards that will be sentimental to some and collectible for reasons, but I'm talking mainly from a gameplay perspective, as well as a few other things that I'll come to in a moment. But before we do that, let's talk about today's sponsor. The world is burning and action on a larger scale is needed. Systemic changes and actions by those at the top. There's no guilt tripping here. Recycling in your home is but a drop in an infinite ocean that needs a much larger action. Ren.co is a website that allows you to calculate your carbon footprint and then to offset that by volunteering to pay towards climate conservation projects like planting trees, protecting rainforests, and other focused efforts. There's a carbon footprint calculator that allows you to figure out how much of an environmental impact your lifestyle has, and then when it looks to bring together collective action through you volunteering funds to fund initiatives like planting trees or the use of um, biochar in agriculture, for example, to help offset this. Like I said, this is not a guilt trip to you about eating red meat. Hell, I do it. I'm doing it tonight after I record this video, even though I know I probably shouldn't. Instead, it's collective funding initiatives that help with the growing issue that affects us all. So why not offset some of your carbon footprint today with Ren? The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description below will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Description in the link below, it helps to support the channel. And thanks to Ren for continuing to sponsor my videos. Now, the list. Viscerasia, but not this one. I'm talking about this one. This is a hidden card variant of Viscerasia found in some secret lairs. The drop with the Praetors, I believe. It's a reverse printed where everything on it is flipped, except for the collector number at the corner of the art. To explain hidden cards, there's an extra card in every secret lair, uh, which varies from super unique collectibles like this to uh, much more common alt arts of cards in there or basic lands. For example, if I recall correctly, I got a Phyrexian Swamp in my Praetor secret lair when I got mine. Some people were lucky and got this though, one of 100 copies. And oh, only 100 copies. Think about that for a second. The one you're seeing on screen right now is 1% of the whole world supply of this reverse printed foil viscerous here. And it's currently sitting at a market value price of around $3,500. And whilst viscerous here sees commander play and has seen play in formats like modern as part of infinite loop combos involving things like kitchen finks, it also is massively printed and a common, meaning you can pick up a playable copy of this from M11 for just 35 cents. And may I also add, M11 feels like yesterday. I only thought viscerous here been in the game for a lot longer than that. Thusly, a hugely expensive and super rare and desirable version is essentially point from a gameplay perspective and experience. In some ways, this is the fucking ideal. This is the dream. Cards being available for less than a dollar, but having super duper desirable chase variants or collectible variants that allow you to indulge in that inner magpie. They allow you to have a collection that you take pride in or cards that will go up in value over time. All these things are valuable to a collectible card game, but they have no effect on the gameplay. So having, having both options, is fantastic. In many ways, this Viscerasia is perfection, but pointless. All at once, it's a paradox. The three Ps. Piss. That's not one of the three Ps, I just want to say piss. 
Next up, we have another similar case here to Viscera C. I did a video all about this when it happened, which was randomly found in boosters, collector boosters. I say randomly found, they told us about it ahead of time, it was promoted. But you can randomly get this in a collector booster. It's Hidetsuku Devouring Chaos. Uh, it's a cute little demon that I will probably play in my Bellical Demon Tribal deck, but it's not very good. He is 14 cents for a normal copy. A rare that is cheaper than the Seer because the amount of varieties of modern cards is kind of crazy. There's like six different variants of this, all going up in price up towards the high end making uncompetitive rares like this worth absolutely nothing a positive and perhaps a curse in terms of the ongoing longevity of the secondary market and just to clarify Hidetsuku sees zero play across eternal formats where Viscera Seer is part of combo decks and aristocrat decks in some formats Hidetsuku is just a derpy demon. Meanwhile, the chase variant that you opened in something like sub 1%, it might have been sub 0.1% of collector boosters. God knows, we don't really know how many of these actually exist. It's currently sat at $1,568 market average to buy, making it less of a gulf between the normal printing and the expensive one than Viscera Seer. However, because of the cheapness of the original, like, cheap, cheap version of Hidetsugu, it means that actually... Well, Viscera Seer is 100 times more expensive to buy in its most expensive version, but Hidetsugu is 112 times its price for the super duper ultra chase rare. Ultimately, this expensive magic card fucking sucks because barring some dad bod demon dad representation, the card isn't very good. It's not worth the price of admission if you're looking to power up your commander deck in any way other than showing off how much money you've got. Next, Elephant Graver is a land that hunts for colourless, but also regenerates elephants and mammoths, which under the current rules is just elephants, because they amalgamate with them in the interest of a better game and less granularity. This land, which I guess regenerates a Morphon, if we start to get really cute with it, is $300 at the time of recording. But why is that, you're wondering? Well, is it because it's a legacy playable card like Tabernacle? No. Or does it define vintage like Bazaar does? Well, no. Okay, it must be a commander staple and legacy playable. Like Cradle, perhaps? No. None of the above. However, it does have one thing in common with all three of those cards. It's called the Reserve List. Elephant Graveyard, alongside alpha copies of Farmstead that I mentioned at the beginning of the video, are cards that are largely dishwater, dog shit, steaming fucking turds. Although, to be fair, Elephant Graveyard is a cut above Farmstead, because at least it has the application with changelings. Anyway, they are shit, and they can never be reprinted, though, because they, they were promised not to be reprinted by Wizards of the Coast. They made a promise not to, in order to um, shed off the criticisms of their mass reprinting things in the early days of the game, and to secure the confidence of collectors, investors, store owners and similar. So that means they creep up in value as collect items over time, slowly but surely. They also are then the subject to awful manipulations in the secondary market from buyouts because the supply is so low. Graveyard, for instance, was only ever printed in Arabian Nights. Um, Reserveless cards from Arabian Nights tend to really collect higher price tags simply from the fact that Arabian Nights got them one printing. The Reserveless cards that are in Alpha and Beta also got third and fourth edition printings essentially, meaning you can get cheaper versions of Farmstead, but this land was a one and done. Thus, the Reserveless cards will ever get more expensive. There is a loophole though with gold bordered stuff, what I'll talk more about in a moment, so wizards could reprint these. In short though, buy your Dwarven Ponies now card is absolutely shite. It's unplayable garbage, even in formats like old school. But it's cheap plus it's reserve list, so buy, buy, buy. And I'm only saying this because I actually own the largest collection of Dwarven Ponies on the planet. And I might be lying, but you have no way of knowing. But if you buy Dwarven Ponies now, I can cash mine in and buy the moon. Next. Basic lands are important and powerful, but also they're essentially free. Whilst you can buy specific versions of these, you can get these for free from any store, player, or anywhere where my magic product is opened. We can't get rid of these things fast enough. They're like, they're like Kipple or Kibble or whatever it is in... I'm, I'm making a literary reference there. They're just everywhere. They multiply. They grow. But there are, of course, super rare versions of these as well. A prominent collectible and symbol of affluent wealth and spending within magic, or just saying you've been in the game for a long time, are the Guru Lands. These are unique promotional lands that were sent out for taking part in the Guru program. The Guru program was where people taught people to play magic. Having been signed up to the Guru program, they'd accumulate points and eventually redeem those points for these being mailed out to them. This is all back in the yesteryear of 2001. The lands feature art by the then darling of the community, Therese Nielsen, and were coveted and progressively climbed to loftier and dearer heights. Now, at time of recording, a Guru Island is around 900 bucks to purchase. 
So now they are basically infinitely more expensive than any cheap land that you can get for free, a basic island. But the art is also controversial and open to a lot of discussion and debate and brings up some problems. This is going to be the most controversial part of this video, uh, so buckle up. People are going to tell me to not get political, but ultimately existence is political. So I can't not do that. If you don't like it, you can turn off now, but I urge you to consider... I don't know, some of the points I'm about to make. Therese Nielsen was outed as being overtly conservative, which the magic community online did not like at all. This bit is open for a bit of discussion on how much people can be at odds with each other in terms of their voting habits. For example, a lesbian woman, in this case, voting for Trump, especially at the original point of his campaign. There's arguments that, you know, we should be able to live in harmony in spite of this. I'm not going to get into that right now. However, as people looked further and further into Therese Nielsen's follows on Twitter, what she's liked, what she's retweeted, it became clear that she was liking and retweeting and following people who were into Q and non-conspiracies and were posting transphobic shit. She was following people who are trans-exclusatory radical feminists, TERFs, if you will. People that do not believe that trans women are women or may even go as far as to try and deal with the trans question and all this sort of stuff. The people that don't believe that trans rights are human rights. I often get people getting shitty in the comments when I touch on things about Therese Nielsen or other questionable artists like Noah Bradley. And on this occasion, I'm going to actually expand a bit. I normally brush over it because I think my personal politics are kind of obvious to anyone who follows me even remotely closely. So let me just get a few things straight. Firstly, this should go without saying, but unfortunately, with events that have happened recently within communities that I am part of, I have to say it, trans rights are obviously, are obviously human rights. It's such a basic concept, it's strange that I have to say it out loud. And you have to keep in mind that when people say Black Lives Matter or trans rights are human rights or any of these things about marginalised people, that is not an exclusion of others. Me as a white presenting cis male, I am not being excluded from that or having my rights eroded. The idea is that my rights are just up there usually because I am part of the status quo and the mainstream. The idea of those statements, black lives matter or trans rights or human rights, is to honour or respect or improve the status of people who are marginalised traditionally. It's to help those people make progress into the mainstream and into the centre. So, with that out of the way, I just want to say that I do believe people can defend themselves. I do believe that who you follow on Twitter is not a core defining uh, fucking... That is who you are as a person. You can accidentally follow some pieces of shit. I know I have in the past. So, I do believe that people are open to defending themselves and pointing out where people have got things wrong. However, her original apology was not much of an apology. It was quite frankly shocking and fucking disappointing. It was an attempt to clear things up or clarify anything that had been misconstrued, but when it comes to conspiracy theories like QAnon and similar that are rooted in racist shit and people who are against the idea of improving trans rights, you're not just hurting people's feelings. You're actively doing harm to those people. You're harming the progress of society towards a much more equal place. She didn't refute the points, all but confirming them, in my opinion. And again, that is opinion, but if you're not going to actually refute the points, then at that point, there's no smoke without fire. You're basically saying, well, you caught me, my bad. Well, in that case, fuck you. She then went on to give art to far-right conspiracy theory nutjob YouTube channel Edge of Wonder, a channel obsessed with QAnon conspiracies and other such shit as climate change denial and celebrity cloning. Yeah. <laughs> it was full mask off. And it was sad, right? Because she's such a big part of the game's identity and art over the years. For this reason, I think overpaying for lands that are largely expensive due to her prestige and weight within the game, or the weight the artist once brought, and still does in some ways, is dumb. Dumb in the sense that it feels morally wrong to do so. There is a wider debate to be had about whether or not the art of people that we morally disagree with, or find morally reprehensible, to be probably more exact, what we do with that art. But this isn't the idea of putting, as I've talked about before, the statues of Winston Churchill into museums with context and plaques, or the preservation of art by people like Hitler, for example, in the museum. That's a whole step removed. We're talking about people that we think are morally reprehensible making art for a, a fucking hobby game. It's a, it's a much stranger one in some ways, because I think it's less clear cut. If people don't want to see the art of people that they know are openly bigoted towards their existence, or of sexual predators and similar, we've had quite a few issues like this recently in Magic. It's a discussion within the Magic space at all times, but if people don't want to see that, I think that's reasonable. I think people... It's fair to not want to see that. Ultimately, I'm not going to shame you if I see you playing Therese Nielsen art, because ultimately this art is stuck on play pieces in the game. 
but I also absolutely categorically agree and support those that say it makes them feel uncomfortable and people who want to remove that art alter sleeves alteration scratching it out or just asking wizards to slowly but surely reprint all of these cards with different art force of will is easily Therese Nelson's most famous card and that now has multiple versions with other art on it and I push and I applaud and I want and I request them to do more like that a the card shouldn't be so expensive and b that should be lovely variants by artists that we don't think push to question our very fucking existence I'm personally removing all the Therese Nelson art from my deck slowly but surely I think I'm there now but I used to play a load of it because I liked it I really liked her art so I get the idea of having art that you loved her souls to plowshares her rest in peace being an iconic part of my coming up in magic but you kind of have to throw that to the side and be like, well, that era's over when you find out they're a fucking bigot. Yes, that got pretty heavy pretty fast. And some people are going to be very mad at me for even indulging in it. But I've never quite openly talked about it before. And recent events have made me want to. Recent events that I won't go into. But I think I just want to make it abundantly clear where I stand on this shit. The last point I'm going to say on this is that if you are going to defend her in the comment section, and there will be people doing this... If you are trying to defend conservatism in general, because that's where it all began, right? She's a conservative and we didn't agree with that as the intolerant left. But if, you're, if your attempt to defend conservatives requires you to defend someone who is aligning themselves with QAnon, like radical conspiracies and transphobia, then perhaps examine, is that really the side you want to be on? With that out of the way, let's talk about the last one, Black Lotus. That's right, it's the big zinger, it's the big hitter, it's really fucking expensive, it's very prestigious, it's arguably our crown fucking jewel. And what's the point? What's the fucking point? It's the only one on this list that's actually incredibly powerful. Like, Black Lotus is... Part of its price tag is because it was the most powerful card in the first set and one of the most powerful cards of all time. Although I actually think it's probably second or third at this point. That's a different video that might be coming out next week. But my point is... Who gives a shit? Like, ultimately, it's legal nowhere but vintage old school and cubes, so getting play out of it is quite difficult. And with Wizards now reprinting Black Lotus in a version that looks legal but isn't because you don't want to get sued, like, who fucking cares at this point? In some ways, it diminishes my want to have a Lotus. I've always wanted to own one. If I only really won the lottery, I'd snap by a Lotus. I probably still would to be a bit of a hypocrite. But the desire to buy one now is diminished by the fact that they're doing a half assed reserve list removal. I do believe they've reversed, removed the reserve list and, you know, reprinted Lotuses. And I do believe the old ones would hold their value because new art often doesn't hold a candle to the old one in terms of its collectability so i really wish they'd have gone full reserve list out from under us and just gone for it but instead we've got this weird topsy-turvy it's not legal in commander shit i kind of hate it fuck it print your own don't buy wizards proxies fuck them thanks for watching today's video i hope you enjoyed it oh god what have i done uh let me know in the comment section below if you have any thoughts on the video the topics at hand the cards i chose did i miss something out that you think is incredibly expensive but not worth it let me know down below thanks to ren for sponsoring this video and i'll see you all soon ta-ta for now